Okay, we talked about fiscal policy. Let's talk about monetary policy, which is a little more complicated. In particular, monetary policy has a little bit more of a transmission mechanism than fiscal policy. So let's start off by drawing the market for money. I've got money supply, money demand, and now I've also got my aggregate demand, aggregate supply. set up just like that. Now the central bank here is going to try and increase the money supply and when it increases the money supply it succeeds in lowering interest rates. Right? The interest rate is falling. How does that spill over to aggregate demand? The key is again the idea that, that prices and wages in the economy are, are a little sticky. They don't adjust very quickly. And if you remember my Fisher equation, that I equals pi plus R, if we think that this pi term is fixed in the short run, the change in I spills through directly to the change in R. And this is good for things like investment, if we remember our market for loanable funds. And I don't want to draw all the diagrams here, but you certainly could if you want. So this is also good for our net exports. Why is it good for our net exports? Well, as we remember from the market for foreign exchange, interest rates across countries mediate the flow of goods and services, right? Here, interest rates are falling in Canada, which makes Canada a less attractive place to invest, which means that more people take their money out of Canada, which is going to push down the Canadian dollar, right? That's a whole lot going on. I, I might attempt to do all of this in a diagram, but the key thing is that aggregate demand is still just C plus I plus G plus NX. And my monetary policy is helping out these I and NX terms. So here, when the central bank prints money, it's shifting out the aggregate demand curve. And so the aggregate demand curve shifts out, and the printing of money stimulates the economy into a boom. And prices rise, which is exactly what we should expect, right? The central bank prints money, leads to prices rising. But this short-run equilibrium here at Y1, P1 is not a sustainable equilibrium, right? It's above long-run aggregate supply. None of the money printing that the central bank did affected our long-run aggregate supply. We still have the same amount of technology, the same number of workers, the same number of factories. Extra dollar bills don't change any of that. Well, what happens next? When the economy is running unsustainably hot like it is at Y1, right, wages start to rise. And the wages rising are what pushes up short-run aggregate supply. So wages rise, wages ri rise, wages rise, and we end up somewhere up here at P2 for the long-term equilibrium, right? So monetary policy, just like fiscal policy, acts on the aggregate demand curve, but they stimulate different parts of it. Monetary policy is really good for investment and exports. Fiscal policy is direct G. So different components of aggregate demand, but both are pushing on aggregate demand. Here, the central bank printing money to try to stimulate the economy works for a time, but just like when the government tries to stimulate the economy, the effects are only temporary. Wages and prices adjust, and when wages and prices adjust, the short-run aggregate supply curve moves up, and we have to get back to long-run aggregate supply. If we do not increase our capacity to produce, we're always going to get dragged back to the long-run aggregate supply. And so wages end up undercutting the central bank's expansionary plans, and we get a temporary boom. However, as a preview of the next video, if there's an aggregate demand problem, since monetary policy operates on aggregate demand, Monetary policy is going to be really good at fixing aggregate demand problems, just like fiscal policy, and both of them are going to be kind of bad at fixing supply-side recessions.